So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, one of our main objectives today is to get feedback from you, or at least from some of you, so uh, that we uh, improve anything that needs to be improved in the license before publication. As you will see in the slide about history, it took us quite some time to uh, draft the current text. Uh, it's quite a lot of effort, so uh, it, it won't happen very often, and this is an opportunity where I hopefully like a month away from publication, so it's a good opportunity to have impact if you see that something in the license will not work for you. So this contribution from uh, any of you can happen in a number of ways. You can raise your hand at any moment during the presentation, please, and uh, stop us for questions, comments, anything. Uh, you can also devote like half an hour to go through the text of the license and mentally apply it to one of your projects and to see if there is any showstopper and then uh, write to us so we can fix it before publication. So with that said, uh, the CERN Open Hardware License is actually a suite of licenses uh, and we will say much more about it later. Uh, and they are designed for supporting the sharing of open hardware designs. So historically, the first version saw the light in 2011 after some discussions in 2010 and it was triggered by our uh, vision to have uh, something equivalent in terms of sharing environment to our friends in the free and open source software world. So we identified a number of things we needed to do to get there. One was building a place to uh, share these designs and we created the open hardware repository, so it was relatively easy. Then we discussed with companies to come up with good business models because as opposed to free open source software, companies are an essential ingredient in open source hardware. Uh, then the third thing we identified we needed to do is because we work with companies and companies are risk averse in terms of legal uncertainties, we wanted to give a sound legal basis. So we came up with a certain open hardware license. And the fourth one, which is still underway, is um, make sure we have good free and open source software tools to design hardware. So we're also contributing to that. So we came rather quickly with the first uh, two versions, then we fixed some things, some mistakes in, in version 1.2, and we were quite happy with it for the type of designs that we were licensing with it, which was mainly printed circuit boards. And uh, 1.2 was never meant to cover HDL, because at the time I thought that, okay, I should say that this was with a reciprocal mindset, okay, so CERN OHL was a copyleft type of license. I don't like the word copyleft so much because it's more rights than copyright in, in CERN OHL, but it was a reciprocal license, okay? And, um, and for reciprocal licensing of HDL, I thought that LGPL and GPL were good options at the time. Um, and then, in 2015, I gave a talk actually in Orconf when it was held at CERN, explaining to people in the audience how I interpreted the terms of GPL and LGPL as applying to HDL. And I thought I was right, and I thought we, we were using at the time LGPL 2.1 or later, and we were happy. But after the question and answer session, uh, I got convinced that it, they were not adequate, uh, LGPL and GPL. Then came, as with any development, time to revise CERN OHL, and we decided to take the opportunity to actually enlarge the scope uh, so that we could cover HDL as well. And that took us to a first draft in 2017, which turned out to be too complex. Because we, we really wanted to keep it simple, but we were trying to do too many things at the same time in, a, in one piece of text. And then we decided to split it in three. You will see how, inspired by the Creative Commons family of licenses, so there's like a menu where you can have permissive, weak copyleft, or strong copyleft. And, and that's where we're at today. So, um, <clears throat> the goals, um, mainly as I say, we want to contribute to the creation of a commons uh, of open hardware designs, uh, but we want to cater for all the sensibilities out there and all the needs of different projects. So we acknowledge there's a big community uh, for permissive licensing, uh, so there will be a dash P uh, license, which is permissive. Dash L is weakly reciprocal. We will see what that means later. And dash S is a strongly reciprocal license. And then we want to also enlarge the scope of the type of designs we cover. So uh, it's not only mechanical, PCBs, etc. as before, it's also silicon. And in particular, HDL for FPGA and ASIC design. And we also want it to stay simple and easy to understand. 
okay, some of the challenges we faced or were facing, uh, the scope of copyleft in the reciprocal variants. So we call L, S, and P the three variants, okay? Um, the two reciprocal variants are L and S, and uh, we need to define where the copyleft obligations stop, okay? Then compatibility with other licenses, it was signaled to us, in a, I think it was in a FOSDEM talk, that it was not compatible with GPL, so we took that into account and we have an answer to that that we will present later. Um, and then the specificities of FPGA and ASIC design, in particular the fact that the uh, primitive libraries are very proprietary and uh, impossible to license under an open, uh, currently under an open source license. Also the fact that in the FPGA world there is this entity called the Bitstream that gets shipped as well, so we have to give some legal standing to that term, etc. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so during the course of the major rewrite, we also um, addressed some fundamental wording and terminology issues uh, that we had as well. So first of all, very simple one, we eliminated uh, gendered language in the license, so there isn't any of that anymore. Uh, we also simplified the terminology somewhat as well. So we used fairly complex terms, which admittedly mean you know, uh, uh, something to people in this room, like the word instantiate, for example. But we thought, why not use simple terms like make? So we, we use words like make and product rather than terms like it's instantiate. We used to have, um, as a defined term, the, the term intermediate form, and we don't have anything like that. So it reads, still reads like a legal document, but it doesn't use the same sort of stilted terminology that we had before. So hopefully it is somewhat easier to understand, although it necessarily it's still a fairly, fairly complex document. Uh, we borrowed terms from other licenses, which are well understood by lawyers who work in the free and open source area. So terms like convey, which people who are familiar with GPL version 3 um, will understand and know. Uh, from a legal perspective, we decided to be absolutely clear that this is a contract and not a bare license. Uh, I probably don't so I really want to go into the sort of the distinction with that at the moment, but part of the problem is that there's this legal concept of a bare license that only really works in common law jurisdictions uh, like England and Wales or the US. It doesn't really work in the rest of the world. Um, so in France, for example, that wouldn't work. Uh, so we decided to just say the reality is this is a contract and we've drafted it accordingly. And interestingly, it now works for software as well, and we'll talk a little bit about how that would work later. But because we have things like bitstreams, which are you know, halfway in the domain between hardware and software, once you've got it to work for things like bitstreams, you're pretty close to having it working for software. So it is possible to use it as a software license, and in fact has some interesting advantages over some of the other free and open source software licenses uh, that are out there. So let's talk about the scope of the license. Now, uh, this isn't um, a, a quote from the license itself, but it uses the license's terminology just so you can get a feel for that. So in the LNS variants, so those are the two reciprocal variants, if you make a product using covered source, you must make the complete source available to a recipient of the product. So if you distribute the product, you've got to make sure that the recipient has access to the complete source of it. And you can do that either privately, so you can just make sure that they have a copy of the complete source if you give them a copy, uh, if you give them the product in question. Or preferably, and this is m much more likely to happen in reality, you point them in a direction of some repository that contains the complete source, and then they will be able to just access it, use it, and download it directly. And you've got to license that complete source itself under the CERN OHL. So, you know, none of that should look the slightest bit strange to anyone that is familiar with normal reciprocal software licenses uh, like GPL, for example. So what do we mean by complete source? Well, it includes uh, all the design materials uh, and interfacing information, etc. And, but what it does not include is something that we call available components. So for available components, you only have to provide the specifications and the interface information. And we'll give some examples of that. It'll make it clearer in terms of what we're talking about. Okay, so Andrew will be telling you about the key concepts of available components and products later, but these two key 
th these two concepts are really key in the license. So remember, available components and product. Okay, both of these things are defined very precisely and play an important role in the license. Um, it is also very important when you discuss about the license to know what your product is. For example, um, if you are licensing the design for a printed circuit board, then the printed circuit board is your product, okay? And then uh, there will be inside that circuit board components, oh sorry, components uh, like resistors and capacitors which might or might not be available, okay? If they qualify as an available component, like typically a resistor would qualify as an available component, then you, didn't, you don't need to, s to supply the sources uh, of how to make a resistor out of carbon and metal film, okay? Which is, you know, we're, we're trying to really take into account current practice and, and be sensible. Um, your circuit board could also contain an FPGA, and that would also be an available component because you can go and purchase it, okay? Um, then that FPGA might contain a bitstream, and that's also a component of the FPGA. But this is for a project of a PCB. Um, maybe your project is an HDL project and the bitstream is actually the, the end product of that project. Okay, okay, so the point I'm trying to make is when you discuss about the CERN license and you try to figure out what, how to map the different terms to your particular project, you need to take into account what is your final product. Okay? Then um, the bitstream might have been developed using HDL that uses standard libraries from a vendor which are proprietary, etc. So all these things have to be taken into account. That's going down and going up. Uh, the circuit board might be inside an enclosure. So you have questions as to whether you know, the, the enclosure, the obligations for copyleft go uh, up to the enclosure and, and we need to make sure that they don't go there. Uh, then that could be in a rack and it could be in a data center. So, uh, but you could also design a rack and publish it as open hardware. So uh, basically the message from this slide is that you need to make sure that um, you know what your final product is uh, before reading and trying to match the terms in the open hardware license. Okay, so available component. All right, so, so I'm just, just going to make back, back and wait, make one particular point about this. So um, in order to make use of the license, if you're developing some sort of design, it's going to make life a lot easier in the future if you can think in terms of these hierarchies. So if you're making something uh, that is a circuit board uh, and it contains these components, then think about what license you want at each of these different levels. Um, and you might want to have different licenses at different levels. You might want um, some, some of the components, uh, you might want the bitstream um, to be available, for example, um, under a much more liberal license than you do the circuit board itself. So it, th this, this concept of having components at different levels is a very, very powerful one. In the same way as if, if you're developing a piece of software, you might have the core code released under one license, but uh, like the GPL, for example, but then it might have libraries that are plugged in that might be useful to use elsewhere, and you might use something like LGPL for the libraries, and then you might have interfaces which you would release under a really liberal license like Apache to make it very easy for people to build those interfaces into their proprietary products and so on. So uh, we're encouraging people to think in terms of looking at different levels when they're thinking of applying the license rather than just taking a complex design and saying CERN OHL applies to all of this. Um, to say, no, you know, CERN OHL S will apply to the circuit board, uh, CERN OHL P will apply to the power supply, for example. Um, so just, just as, a, as a, a, a sort of putting that in context a little bit. So what is an available component? Well, it's anything that, first of all, if itself is available under the CERN OHL or a compatible license. So, you know, that chimes with what I've just said about thinking about the different levels and thinking about different components. Uh, which are licensed potentially under different licenses. Um, and a compatible license is basically any license that you can treat as being the CERN OHL. So something like Apache, SolderPad, MIT, BSD. You could treat something licensed under those as treated under the CERN OHL if, if you want. So you can treat that um, as a compatible license. So any component which is available under those licenses is an available component. And if you recall, that means that you do not have to provide the complete source for that particular component. Um, all you have to do is provide the relevant interfacing information for it. So, um, Alternatively, 
It could be any component um, which is available with the um, specifications, characteristics, and information that's necessary to make the product. So this would be something like a resistor. You don't have to provide the recipe for making a resistor. You just have to know that it's a quarter watt resistor, uh, 220 ohms, um, uh, what the tolerances are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and depending on the context, you might need more information or less information. You, you, know, you, you, you might need to know the power handling. You might not, because it you know, might, 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 not, might not be relevant to that particular circuit. You might need to know what its physical size is. You might not. Um, but if you've got the relevant information for that particular component that you need to make that product, then you don't have to provide the recipe for making the available component. It's just something you can go out and get. And obviously, you might have to pay for it. You know, it doesn't assume that an available component is always something uh, that's necessarily going to be free of charge. That obviously doesn't make any sense at all as far as hardware is concerned. Uh, but you'll recall that we were talking about the possibility of the CERN OHL being used for software as well. And that would also apply to software components that you might incorporate within a design. And thirdly, um, if it's part of the normal distribution of the tool chain that you're using, uh, then also it's an available component. And this is a little bit similar to the system libraries exception uh, that you have under the, the GPL. And it just really re reflects the realities of life that if you're using a proprietary tool chain, you're not going to have any option. You're going to have to use some components in there which are part of that proprietary tool chain. Um, and it would just make really, really over restrict the use of the license if uh, those weren't accepted. So what do we mean by the term product? Well, it, it can be a finished product, obviously, but it also can be it's a, um, a component. Um, so you can make something into a component which then can fit into another product. So again, we're talking about this, this hierarchy of layers. Or it could be some form of intermediate form which is derived from the complete source. So you could take some HDL and you could compile it into a bit stream, or you could take some C code and you could compile it into an object file. And both of those would be an intermediate form. And if you then convey that immediate form, intermediate form to somebody else, you then would have to provide the complete source for that as well. So a bit on scope of copyleft. Would it be worth having a bit more of a discussion about the available component and, and product stuff? Did anyone have any questions about available components? Because it's, the, as you say, they're the two key kind of concepts in the OHL v2. Yes. And for instance, you know, you were doing a PCB and you have the PCB design is open source under one of the CERN OHL licenses. Now you, in, you put a chip on that PCB. That's an available component, right? Something yes. you can buy off. Farnell Anything you can buy is an available component. Okay. We will get later to the distinction between strong and uh, weakly um, uh, reciprocal variants. Yeah. Uh, but I can already tell you that um, anything you can buy is an available component in uh, dash L, in the weakly reciprocal variant. In the strongly reciprocal variant, it has to be a physical object, like a resistor. Yeah. It cannot be a core, for yeah. example. So it so can't be IP. It has to be something, yeah. Exactly. So um, the production line. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting a bit ahead of the slides, but okay. that's that's a very important concept. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anything which is an available component does not have to be released. It's not it's not part of complete source. And the definition of available component is the main difference between the weak reciprocal and the strong reciprocal. So I, I forgot that I was supposed to, to interrupt you. Uh, so I, I was just thinking, do you address uh, chiplets with this? Chiplets? Yeah. So uh, you have to tell me what that is, sorry. Is it? So Well, the idea of, of uh, combining several uh, dice into a, yeah. a chip. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I don't do basic design. Uh, and um, I don't do chiplets. But the... Um, uh, you have, again, for analyzing any question, you have to take a step back and say, what is my design and what is my product? If your design is the complete um, chip made of, made of chiplets, right? Uh, then those chiplets will be available components if they satisfy one of the three conditions. Uh, so um, either the chiplets themselves are released under the license, under the CERN OHL, or you can buy them, okay, they are available. 
or they are, they are part of a normal distribution, which in this case wouldn't be the case probably. But probably the second one, if, if you can buy them off somebody, then they would qualify as available components. So I can see why you're doing the available component stuff, because otherwise the license is just not really practical, right? Because as you said, you can't compel everyone to release all the information on all the stuff you need to make a circuit board, because you know that might you, they might have to explain how to do tooling, all sorts of yeah, things, yeah, right? Yeah. But I but it kind of severely weakens the reciprocity of the license, right? So for instance, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes IP is available, but with lots of strings attached. So it's very common in the IP industry for people to release. IP blocks that are free, but you have to use their tool chain and their devices, and they're trying to tie you into a proprietary ecosystem with that available IP, right? Mm -hmm. And this this license just allows that system to work that way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the license makes uh, no comment about the tool chains, uh, so it's only about the sources. And if the sources are released and then uh, under a free and open source license, then they qualify. Uh, things yeah. are available, they can, be, they can be available with any strings attached. You know, like with the, if, if that IP is gettable somehow, then you might have to exchange money, you might have to commit to using a certain ecosystem. That, it still counts as being available. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it, it is, it is uh, available under the second bullet. I don't know if you want to comment. Um, it's got to be available to anyone, so there is a non-discriminatory thing there. Um, but I mean, th th this, this, this is, you know, we had a lot of discussion about this. I mean, it's a very pertinent question, obviously, um, and it's important. So, so first of all, um, we, we, we figured that this was much more of an issue in the digital domain uh, than it is in the physical domain, which is why we have this distinction that Javier mentioned earlier um, about um, the extent um, to which we're able to use this exemption um, in the... Uh, in the, the distinction between the strong and, and the weak versions. Um, so, in the strong version, this doesn't apply to things that are purely um, this bit. The, the middle one doesn't apply to um, uh, things that are purely in the digital domain. Uh, but yet, we always have this part in here that's part of the normal distribution of the tool chain. And that means that if you are using you know, an extremely expensive tool chain, um, and one that has got lots of proprietary components in it, then, yeah, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. We weren't happy about that conclusion, but I think that that's just my understanding anyway is the reality of the way that the industry is, is working. And, you know, there's a limit to the extent to which you can ask a license to do that sort of heavy lifting in terms of forcing people to use different sorts of, of tooling. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. There are, there are also certification efforts that can complement what a license can do. So um, uh, for open source hardware, there is the open source hardware certification. And you only get it if you follow a number of rules. And um, that's, um, you can put anything in those rules, right? But uh, there's, there's some things that a license can't do. OK, so yeah. uh, one uh, yeah. more question. Please. Yeah. Uh, what about components that are um, available now, but not next year, which are end yeah. of life, or uh, things happen? Yes, to, so to that's a, a very good question we also got from somebody else. So we corrected uh, the definition uh, such that uh, the component must be available at the time you publish the design. Okay, so you, you don't make any commitment to it being available later on. You can't. So I want to make specific about available for everyone. You have SD cards, you have the SDIO specification which is only available for members of the SD uh, thing. So is, can that still be an available component or not if it's that specification? Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if it's available to um, anyone, yes, it is. But, I mean, uh, what does anyone mean? And, and this, this is, you know, I, we, we've had a lot of discussion about this, and it, it really is very difficult to put it in, 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 into the license. Um, um, Clearly, there is a point at which, you know, if you're paying for something, you're going to have to pay for some of this stuff. That's absolutely fine. But there may be a distinction between, between paying $200 and $200,000. Um, we can't put a figure, a figure in, in the license. So that's something that really would have to be governed by community norms more than anything else, unfortunately. Which is why I think what Javier was saying earlier about this idea of sort of parallel certification 
is actually really important because we were getting a lot of questions saying things like, um, and you know, all of you will be aware that there have been lots of attempts to try in the software world, try and get software licenses to do things like, you know, you can only use this license if you don't have unreasonable working practices. You can only use this license if it isn't used in circumstances that create harm for people. And they're all very laudable aims, but copyright and intellectual property rights are really not the right sort of forum for dealing with those. So we would encourage people to look at other potential certification um, mechanisms. I mean, some of the things that we were asked were, for example, uh, you know, repairability. I mean, this is people are very, very keen on repairability. Um, sustainability. Can we, we say that the design has to be made with sustainable materials? That's very important, but it's not really appropriate for to, to go in a license like this. So, if there's a certification regime that says this design can be made with, with sustainable materials, then great, sign up to that as well. You know, it's a little bit more complicated, but hardware is more complicated than software. Any other questions? But uh, I just want to say something also about the availability, general, I mean, uh, citizens of North Korea, China these days, I mean, is that also an issue? I mean, we, we recently had the issue with uh, certain Chinese companies not having access to things. Yes, I, I got a similar question from somebody because buying, for example, in China in Shenzhen is not something that everybody can do because sometimes you have to speak Chinese or read Chinese, etc. Uh, for me, in that case, it is available. Uh, you know, it just it's not just because you don't speak a language that you know people can. No, the, I, the other but, way around. But but uh, the the one you ask. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, as Andrew says, in the end, it's, it's something that would be very, very difficult to codify in a licensed text, uh, probably. So maybe community norms are better to solve that one. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. I, I, Uh, we are talking about the available components. Why are we not talking about the just interfaces? Because we may specify interface, and yes. we do not care about the component anyway, anywhere anymore. Yes, that's that's what it says here. If you if you can get the component with enough interface information to make the product, then that's uh, that's an available component. So is that what you're suggesting? That interface information is necessary. Yes, you can you can design a box, you can draw a box in a circuit diagram with just the interfaces, and that what that box, you know, you don't need to publish anything that's behind it. Yeah. So in in software, there is these days some uh, people that say uh, these cloud companies are sort of abusing their things without paying back, and I can see with FPGAs going in the cloud that this could also be a problem for IP. Uh, is this something you're thinking about covering, or is this like completely out of scope for this license? Uh, yes, this should provide a means, uh, so these three uh, license texts, they are tools and people can use them as they want. So you have permissive, weakly reciprocal and strongly reciprocal. If you have an FPGA design and you publish your code under dash S, which is the strongly reciprocal variant, then anybody who modifies that design and um, um, distributes hardware based on that modified design must publish their modifications under the same license. So this is a tool that currently, uh, in my opinion, does not exist in the FPGA world. Uh, we don't have an appropriate, strong, reciprocal licensing regime for FPGAs. Uh, then how people will use it and when, uh, it's, it's up to them. But the tool will exist, yes. Okay, but say someone goes and modifies that IP and they put in some really fancy new stuff. Can't they just draw a box around the fancy stuff and say that's actually another IP yes. that you can buy from me and therefore it's available and I don't have yes. to release any Yes, in dash L they can, in dash S they cannot because dash S in the definition of available component says that only physical components qualify. So uh, that's the main difference between dash S and dash L. And can be the internal part strong and the one you added around weak um, okay so your product is weak mm -hmm. and you have some weak parts and some strong parts yes uh, no the s the s would be requiring them to publish the whole thing right 
So if I if it's take digital, a single, if it's a if it's a digital design that you're speaking about, yes. I mean, I have a, a single a strong IP core. Yes. And I'm building a PCB with an FPGA with, where I put that IP core and then yes. I build the PCB. Yes. Do do everything needs to be strong, or no? That's no, no. When you publish your um, core, uh, then people will use it in a project for which the ultimate result will be a bit stream. Uh, in the case of an FPGA, okay, so the limit will stop there. And this is the, actually the point of this slide uh, where we talk about where the obligations stop. So going up, it stops at product. Okay, so the product in the case of an HDL um, project is the bitstream or the mask in the case of ASICs or whatever, but it doesn't go beyond, okay? And this is very important. This is why we say that product and available component are very, very important concepts in the license because they limit the scope of copyleft. Okay? Going up, it stops at product. Going down, it stops at available component. So one example, if I uh, design a PCB which is the motherboard of a PC, my product is the motherboard. I don't have to release, when I distribute the PC, I don't have to release the uh, design files for the case of the PC, for the enclosure and for the power supply. Okay, because the product for that design is the PCB. Uh, the uh, notion of product also constrains sideways, not only upwards. See, if I design a mouse or a keyboard uh, and I license it under certain OHL, then if I connect it to a PC, I don't need to release the design files for the PC just because I connected them. Uh, and then going down, it's available component. So <laughs> it's a bit complex because we have these three variants, okay, but um, um, a resistor will always be an available component in the three variants. Okay? An HDL core uh, will be a, a, that you can purchase, a proprietary core that you can purchase, will be an available component under P or L, but will not qualify as an available component under S, which is what you expect. I mean, uh, you know, S is strong reciprocal, so you should have all the sources. The only um, um, the only exception we did also with even with the S is that when you're designing with Xilinx, Altera, Intel, etc., it's very, very difficult that your design does not contain uh, proprietary primitives from these, uh, from these vendors. Okay? So that's why we included in the definition of available component that it can also qualify if it's part of the normal distribution of the tool chain. And that also applies in the case of S. Okay? So it is a bit complex, but I think we are achieving with each one of the variants the, the, the effect we want. Okay? So uh, in the case of an FPGA, for example, uh, you can use proprietary primitives of, your, of the design tool, but you cannot use proprietary cores that do something else. Okay, okay so uh, here I say, I, I think I've said all of these already. So um, the difference between strong and weak regards the definition of available components. In the case of strong, we only allow them to be physical, so no cores, no HDL cores, okay? Uh, and why physical only? Because, okay, strong, in the strong case, we want to be as copyleft, as reciprocal as possible, but within reason. Uh, nobody is expected to give you the recipe to make a resistor, okay? And then we also have a permissive variant, and the reason is that uh, we acknowledge the fact that there are many people out there who are in a, in a permissive mindset or in a permissive environment where things would not work if it were not a permissive license. Uh, it was a, long hang, a low hanging fruit for us because it's just a simplification of all the, of, of the other two variants, okay, stripping down to the minimum, uh, but keeping very useful things that we have thought through these years. So, it was an easy thing to do, also with Andrew's uh, extensive experience in, in, uh, with solder pad uh, that we can capitalize on. And, um, and the advantage is that, okay, you get in the same family of licenses, you get a permissive one, so you, you, are, you stay in the same family, you have the same language. Uh, it's, uh, it, plays out, it, it plays very nicely with the other two variants. And there's a, a solid institution behind that's, uh, that has a good record on, on their commitment to open source, so it can last. And, and be stewarded properly. Um, and then uh, there has been a debate lately in permissive licensing as to whether actually one is permitted to relicense BSD code or relicense MIT code. Um, so we decided to play safe and explicitly say in the license text that it can be relicensed. 
Okay, and then this um, um, issue of um, whether we should be allowing GPL relicensing. Okay, this is this was a tough uh, a, a tough question for us because um, of course GPL compatibility is somebody is something that uh, is a requirement by many people, and it came up during a FOSDEM talk as one criticism of version 1.2, and then we started to look at the problem. And we decided not to allow the relicensing. Uh, one reason is that we did CERN OHL version 2 for a reason, and uh, for a set of reasons, one of which is that GPL does not um, uh, isolate properly uh, going down to the lower bound. Uh, so it covers the primitives, and those currently in ASIC design for most of the designs are proprietary, so it couldn't be done. You can actually uh, carve out exceptions in GPL using the uh, additional permissions mechanism, but then it kind of defeats the original purpose, which is to be compatible with all the GPL software out there. Um, plus, uh, GPL would allow uh, relicensing a CERN OHLS design under GPL would allow escaping some obligations. Like, for example, we, we wanted to put in place a method for people who receive physical hardware to actually go to the design files, find the design files for that piece of hardware. This is the equivalent of what happens in software. You get a binary and you're able to trace back to the sources. Okay? In the case of hardware, the equivalent of the binary is a physical piece of hardware. So if you receive that, you should be able to trace back to the design files. And uh, one of the ideas by Andrew was that um, uh, a URL or some kind of um, uh, reference could be imprinted in the object itself, and then we need to protect that. The people should be, you know, should have the obligation to keep that notice in the object itself. So then it can change hands as many times as they want, but you still have the ultimate recipient of the project still sees that, okay? And that's an obligation. So uh, by relicensing at the GPL, you could escape that obligation. So um, having said that, so that's the reason why we we decided not to go for allowing that relicensability. But if you're okay with this, you can always dual license your project. You can say this is covered under CERN OHLS and GPL. Uh, so uh, which licenses are compatible? Which licenses count as compatible licenses? Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, all of the normal permissive licenses count as compatible licenses. So that's fine. Any component that you've got that's licensed under the, any of those licenses will automatically count um, as an available component because it's available under a compatible license. Um, as far as GPL and LGPL is concerned, um, Savvy says this is, this is um, more um, problematic. Um, from the CERN OHL perspective, um, it's reasonably straightforward. Um, so if you look at it um, for, from, a, from a CERN OHL um, a strong perspective for physical components, um, and for CERN OHL um, lesser perspective for components, including digital, um, you know, it, it is possible to merge components with those two different licenses. But that means that you're complying with the obligations under the appropriate variant of CERN OHL. It doesn't mean that you're complying with obligations under GPL. So really the only way around this fundamentally is that if you do want to have GPL um, compatibility, uh, you should really consider dual licensing your product uh, th through both CERN OHL and GPL. And likewise, if you've got a GPL project that you want to be more easily compatible with CERN OHL, then again, consider relicensing. This is one of the things that we went into in quite great depth in the earlier beta version of, um, of version two. And we this is why it became terribly complicated, because we did draft a whole load of language that was designed explicitly to make CERN OHL uh, compatible with GPL v3 in particular. Um, and it required adding additional permissions to GPL v3, and it required adding some additional wording to CERN OHL. And it just became so much more straightforward if we said, well, if we've got to add this additional language anyway, why not forget about all of that and just say the relevant projects have to be realistic about licensing. And if they want this compatibility, then they should really um, consider dual licensing. So where do we go to from here? Well, Javier um, gave a sort of brief uh, summary of, of where to go to next. Um, so the 
um, URL for all of the latest up-to-date um, versions of the licenses, FAQ, etc., um, is available here, and we'll make sure that these slides um, are also available, hopefully published um, on the event website as well. Uh, we've been consulting with a lot of organizations. We've had some fantastic feedback from people, and it's largely as a result of that feedback that we've actually had such radical rewrites. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. We've pinched some great ideas from people, Julius, for example, um, you know, many other people as well. Obviously, we've stolen ideas from Apache. We've stolen ideas from GPL v3. Um, but we, we've been consulting with many people. So we, we hope that we've got a sort of, you know, a representative um, set of um, commentary from people, and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, if you do want to comment on this, I mean, um, obviously, I, I'm, I'm not sure how long you're going to be around for. I'm going to be around for the next couple of days. Um, just grab us uh, and um, talk to us. But um, those are our email addresses if you want to use some other mechanism to communicate. Any final questions? Uh, I think, all right, are we, I've got time for a question, one question, or should we? Yeah, yeah, time for one question, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, this is already hinted at a couple of times. So was a, a version of the license considered where there was no upper bound on the, uh, um, you know, rep, uh, rep uh, sorry, um, Right, so you have a GPL, the Afero GPL that yeah. exists. Was that considered? And if so, and it didn't make it, why was it shut down? It, it just, I think, we're, if you you look at the list that we we had earlier with the sort of the very, the, the hierarchy of various different things, and we thought this is ridiculous. If you happen to have like an FPGA that's in um, on a circuit board that's um, in a box that's in a rack that's in a data center uh, that's in an industrial estate that you know that the, the whole of the uh, the architectural plans for the entire industrial estate have to be released I mean it's it's sort of absurdity if you go all the way up it's absurdity if you go all the way down uh, so I think um, you know we, we were always very conscious that there was this uh, particular issue about where the boundaries lay I don't know if you want to add anything hi um how much research was done into whether or not um, these components are actually copyrightable? Um, there seems to be a good um, set of evidence that shows that PCB, especially like the PCB designs, are not copyrightable in the US. Um, everybody kind of just treats them as being copyrightable, but um, some uh, like case law in the 1980s seems to indicate that they weren't considered mm -hmm. copyrightable because there wasn't enough creative input into PCB, which kind of seems yeah. feasible to me, but it's what the judges thought. Um, so was there a lot of research into that type uh, of I mean, stuff? I, I, I've done research on that in a different context, um, and you're absolutely right. And, and part of the issue that we've got is that it also varies very dramatically from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And one of the problems that you, you, you have with open hardware licenses um, is that the consistency of application of intellectual property rights is you know, very different from the, the consistency that you have with software. And even with software, we have significant problems. And you also have the addition of other intellectual property rights, such as um, you know, semiconductor mask rights exist in certain jurisdictions. Uh, we also have things like the European database right, which would probably you know, consider some, you know, cover something like a net list as well. So basically, what the CERN OHL does, it says we acknowledge there's a whole bunch of intellectual property rights. Um, and we're not really going to analyze what those are, but if you're exercising any rights under any of those rights, then that means that you're accepting this license. Uh, but it also acknowledges that we're not trying to go any further than that. We're not trying to create any new intellectual property rights. So if you're, what you're doing doesn't infringe any intellectual property right, or if it's something that you can do because you've got some sort of exception, like fair dealing, for example, then CERN OHL won't impinge on that. So that's it's a sort of we try to be just pragmatic there rather than analyze exactly which rights apply to which items. We've just said we acknowledge that there are rights, they will apply to various items. Um, and if you exercise any rights under this license that impinge on those rights, then you're accepting the license. Okay. GPL explicitly says it's limited to copyright. Okay, I have another question about the interfaces. How would you play the specification of the of the interface in um, this kind of license? Is it uh, possible to just create a open hardware license interface or something like this? 
I think what we mean by interface in the case of a PCB design is just the pin out of a component or you know the what you get in the data sheet. So I, I don't know I, I don't know if I understand fully the question. Something like it. Oh, yeah. Something like a next generation wishbone uh -huh. uh, interface or mm -hmm. AXI yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's beyond the scope of the license. I mean, the, any interface, uh, provided it's well defined, uh, will qualify an available component. So I've got a, a difficult uh, concept to add into all of this. I'm working with some um, interconnect logic and software to tie user components together. So imagine a young designer who may or may not be interested at all in open source, and I have an open source interconnect that may take many of his personal, perhaps even proprietary components together, connect them together, and then make a bit stream with it. Um, does that fit in this at all? This idea of, you know, that it's sort of like a middle level and the bottom level isn't part of the tool chain. Mm -hmm. It would have, you know, maybe a bus interface and maybe some other piece that he's doing that's his special uh, sauce. I think, I think the person who should worry is the designer who would take your stuff and his stuff and combine it, right? You, you shouldn't worry. You can just release your stuff as whatever, S, L, or P, and that's your choice. And you have released something. Then whoever wants to use it, if you chose S, strongly reciprocal, they will not be able to combine it with a proprietary core. So it's a decision that belongs then, well, to you to see what is the uh, trade-off between um, the, the um, market penetration of your um, component versus um, how much logic you want to liberate by the copyleft effect. Okay, so it's exactly the same debate as with GPL. Okay, when you publish something, you have to decide in the software world and you're in a reciprocal mindset, you will have to decide if, he, if it's going to be weak or strong copyleft and it's exactly the same kind of um, decision-making process. Strong copyleft will probably trigger the liberation of some code, uh, but it might deter adoption. Uh, weak copyleft might be better in adoption, but so it's, 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 it's exactly the same. Thank you.